pyydän anteeksi, että mä puhun nyt tässä englanniksi, mutta mä ajattelin, että kun täällä on nämä kansainväliset vieraat ja sitten mä oon tiesin kaikki tämä niin tutkimuskirjallisuus on englanninkielinen, niin se on aina helpompaa, että niin käyttääkin näitä termejä sitten niin suoraan englanniksi. So I was just saying that apologizing that I'm, I'm speaking in English instead of Finnish, but of course it's easier because all the terms and all the literature that you read of course anthropologically about this is in English and so it makes it easier. So uh, I was at the beach here in uh, Kiwa. This is a very uh, uh, very particular type of experience for me, transformation, transformational in the sense that I get to uh, uh, I get to speak academically in my home because I have a cottage right across the fields over there and so uh, I'm very familiar with this place. And of course, it's a beautiful space. The yurta was also very nice, but I think it's a good kind of like analogical shift uh, speaking about something that has to do with a very small space, your mind, and how it affects the larger space of the world in this kind of open space that we've moved to now. So, Um, this concept of magical consciousness uh, was something that I happened to mention to Tula at the beach, uh, saying that uh, I'm working on a project which is funded by the Academy of Finland, which is called Mine and the Other, uh, and it's an interdisciplinary project where we look at people's experiences and contact with otherworldly entities and realities. So this is quite controversial, of course, because the ac Academy has given a huge amount of money for a group of researchers to study people's weird experiences. But of course, my own sub-project is a bit more medical because I study people who hear voices. So they basically hear voices in their head without anyone else being present. And of course, this has a psychiatric label of being asymptom schizophrenia, but that's not the whole story, of course. And it's actually the other part of the story that interests me Uh, which is experiences of people who hear voices who don't have a psychiatric diagnosis. Until now, I've only interviewed people who have this diagnosis, and I feel it's been really problematic for me because I have wanted to hear what people do when they have this experience, when it's not disturbing to them. Um, and actually, uh, the reason why I tried to find a concept that would explain experiences of people who move in different levels of reality has to do with an interview that I did with a woman and she came to me through a friend of mine. And um, this was a very impressive experience for me. It was extremely intense and her story was completely incomprehensible to me. It was comprehensible on a certain level, but it was such a mind-blowing experience listening to what she told about the reality that she lives in that I said, how will I ever explain this? How will I find a way of theorizing or find a theory that would explain what is going on in her mind? So then I, um, I familiarized myself with this concept of magical consciousness, um, which is used by uh, uh, a British anthropologist called Susan Greenwood, and uh, she has been studying people who uh, practice contemporary magic in the UK. And she is a practitioner herself, so she's also a very controversial figure in that sense. Because this is a little bit of a taboo in anthropology, especially when it has to do with something that is so internal and personal and invisible as what happens in your mind. And this is, of course, also another thing that's been problematic for me as an anthropologist, Previously, I did research on people who received an organ transplant. So basically, something that is internal to their body, which I can't see. So I'm basically studying an experience that is difficult to see in practice, other than medical practices that evolve around this. And um, for that research and for my present one, I actually went through a patient organization. And so I spoke to people who meet on a regular basis to talk about their experience of voice hearing. And that, of course, means that they also, most of them have this psychiatric diagnosis. So in this project, um, there's a folklorist, uh, a historian of culture, cultural historian, uh, and another medical anthropologist and a psychiatrist. And so they, their areas of research, I mean, the anthropologist who's the, the head of the, of the project, 
Professor Marilisa Hongkasawa, she is uh, studying ancestor worship or, or, or people, contacts that people have with ancestors that they believe are present uh, in normal everyday reality um, in Western Africa and Benin. And then um, the cultural historian is, historian is studying uh, sagas of the living dead, uh, Isla Icelandic sagas, so that's historical research. Uh, and then the folklorist is uh, studying people's experiences of social death. So ba basically people who are elderly and ill uh, and in hospitals and their, their kind of social life has already ended. And, and, and so how do they and their relatives relate to this? And then the psychiatrist is actually going to do research with me and do some uh, brain imaging studies uh, of people who have reported uh, having schizophrenia as a diagnosis and also having a test group of people who don't have the diagnosis of schizophrenia and then a group of so-called normal people to, um, to actually see what happens in the mind um, when they have these uh, experiences of hallucination. So uh, this is the project and we have a project page and we also um, have a blog uh, where we discuss these things and also the issue of interdisciplinarity. Uh, and one big question for us is also how to study invisible phenomena. So um, how do you actually meet this kind of what is called radical otherness? So people who have experiences that we don't have ourselves and they are so different from our own experiences, so how do we actually approach this? And of course, I mean, the approach of Susan Greenwood is in that way very exceptional because she has had these radical experiences herself, and she has actually sought these radical experiences. Um, but then I think also uh, one thing that is important to, uh, to first mention here is also um, um, that you, you need to look at the development of science and rationality so that you can place yourself on a kind of roadmap of where we are in our thinking about the mind and processes of consciousness and what is involved in these transformational processes that happen in the mind. So we can say that right now we're living in an age of utilitarian science and of course we have this Euro-American view that says that the psyche and the earth have no relationship, that matter is dead uh, but constantly evolving according to mechanistic laws. So this stands in, in contrast to this kind of romantic view of the world, where well, they used to see the world as a unitary organism and not as an atomistic machine. And so during Romanticism, I mean, people actually valued these kinds of transpersonal experiences, experiences that were difficult to explain verbally. And it was accepted that people had these types of ex experiences. So we've seen this, this shift historically uh, with the, when, with the development of rational science that has actually made us separate the mind from the body. Um, but then I, there's like two, two um, just for me there's two dominant ideas related to this that kind of stand in the way of having a more holistic approach to the mind and consciousness. And one is this idea of, na of the nature of reality as something that is singular and visible. That the real and only world is the one that is visible to us. Uh, and that we, can, that we can prove exists through the use of scientific testing. Uh, this way of thinking, of course, cuts out ex experiences that take place on the level of an invisible and non-tangible reality. Those that are based in imagination and intuition. So it, for example, cuts off the common experience uh, of experiencing God and believing in God, that God exists, although we cannot um, scientifically prove this. And of course, you also have scientists who believe in God. So this is kind of a very strange thing that exists, that they believe in something that is invisible, but at the same time, they think that we have to be able to prove um, why these phenomena exist using um, the tools of science by testing and quantifying and um, providing evidence of, that it actually exists. So, but of course, throughout history, there's been very ample empirical evidence of experiences of the invisible. 
mystical and extraordinary. And this can also, of course, be then termed transpersonal experiences. And one classical work is that of William James, written in 1902, called The Varieties of Religious Experience. It's a very thick book, and it's basically a book full of data of people's mystical experiences. And um, he was a philosopher and a psychologist, so he was a very influential figure at that time. And of course, at that time, there was also a lot of activity, I mean, around these spiritualist societies and, and um, people uh, discussing psychic issues. And then it just died out because they could not actually prove what happened, what, what are these experiences. <coughs> but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, one thing that was very interesting in our project um, when we received this funding and then it was in the papers, it was written about it in the papers, um, people spontaneously started sending us letters. We didn't ask for them. So until now, we have received 100 letters of people who have wanted to describe their extraordinary experiences. So they could be of messages from deceased loved ones, uh, seeing signs in nature. It's very often saying, okay, this bird, we had these, uh, these swans come to our yard, and we live miles away from any waterway. What were these swans doing here? They were assigned from my deceased father to say that I'm here with you. So there was a, a, a lot of these kind of, of, of experiences described. And they still keep on coming. And I mean, some people have sent us 50 handwritten pages of these experiences. They said, oh, I have 300 pages more. You know, if you want more, I can send you more. And I mean, it's, it's fantastic to receive this kind of material without asking for it. But what are we going to do with this material? Because we haven't actually, you know, we don't have a person who is there to analyze it. So now we end up reading it and analyzing it ourselves. I, I think that the, this your research was in the newspaper because yes. I read it, and I think <laughs> that they were say, they say something that you are looking for uh, yes. material, and I think that that's why. Yeah, they that's said what it, we did. Because I remember this. Uh, yeah. yeah, in the beginning. Um, then when the material started arriving to the project, then we decided, okay, we will actually ask people to send us more material because since there's a willingness to share these experiences, then it's very good to collect it even though we might not use it ourselves, but then it's put into an archive. And of course, all these people, they were then sent a, a form of consent, you know, can we use this material and do you want to be part of this research? And so I think that what's very interesting about this is that there is very many people who have these kind of experiences, but it's very stigmatized and they're afraid of talking about it because they don't want to be labeled as crazy. And I think there's a lot of evidence of this that it's just been destroyed by families. People who've kept diaries, who've written letters, who've told stories and they're just silenced because, um, because it's a sign of being crazy, they think. And so, um, uh, so we can then say, why, why have these experiences been ignored by scientists? And society at large, why is it so taboo to discuss these things? And then, of course, secondly, is this idea of the bounded or sealed mind. So, of course, in the, in the natural science or neurobiological view of the mind, the mind is equal to the brain. It is an organ which is guided by neurochemical processes, and when it doesn't function properly, it is a result of chemical imbalances. Um, and that can cause signs or symptoms such as auditory, visual, tactile hallucinations. And then these, of course, need to be removed by adding chemicals, so by giving medications to people who report having these symptoms. Um, but this, of course, obscures the existence of the experiencing mind. That is a mind that is in interaction with its social environment, a mind connected to what other persons and their minds do and say, and how they interact with us. So what we could say is an intersubjective mind. So this actually, of course, points to the fact that the, the mind is porous. It leaks over. So your consciousness leaks over into the environment. Uh, how do you find, find, how do you find uh, or uh, who is the group of people you're going to be studying uh, with the brain images and, and things like that? How did you? How um, did you they will be selected from the people that I have interviewed plus then people who will be solicited through another psychiatric project, and probably in Norway we haven't really, he's very busy, the psychiatrist, so I mean, it's very difficult to pin down um, how he's gonna select these people.
people, but at least one group are these people who, um, who I've interviewed until now, but then we're trying to find people who don't have a psychiatric diagnosis, mm -hmm. and that's really a challenge to us. So those that you have been interviewing, they, they have some kind of yeah, yeah. Most of them do, okay. yeah. I'd say about 80, 85% of them do, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to know. I mean, one is this, there's a group of people which are called Eritus Heraket, so highly sensitive people. Um, so we're thinking that that could be a group. Because for me, the issue of voice, the, uh, the focus is the vo people who hear voices. But what I feel now is that it's not just the voice. It's all these kind of sensations that they have, all these kind of sensory experiences. So they might have experiences of visions, of touch, of pain. So it's also problematic when you separate it to just the voice. Because I think with all these experiences that uh, kind of bleed over the limits of the consciousness, they are multi-sensory. So it's a wrong approach. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, the, that, that's, that's the challenge that you have as, as an anthropologist is that you put yourself on level zero. You say, okay, there's a phenomenon which is called hearing voices or noises that you don't want to hear, or having sensory experiences that you haven't asked for, they just come to you. So what is this and what does it mean to people and how do they deal with it? Um, and of course, then the, the psychiatric model is one way of doing it. Um, but then of course, in many other cultures, um, you have very many examples of people having these like boundary transgress transgressive experiences and experience of the extraordinary experience of trance of possession um, and in many contexts it's not seen as negative it's seen as something even desirable but of course I mean when you have the whole global movement of psychiatry it's already affecting countries outside of the West and then it's already being stigmatized in another way but there's very very many different ways of dealing with these kind of experiences so this um, the the Western biomedical manner of dealing with it is just one and it's a very limited way of, of looking at it I think and then of course I mean it has to do with this whole um, history of philosophy of, of what is called the Cartesian divide uh, in the 1650s I mean Rene Descartes a philosopher and math mathematician he wrote two very um, influential books um, which has meant that we have started associating uh, the mind with individual human reasoning and that the mind has been located in the brain and it's of course also separated the body from the mind um, because the mind controls the body it's believed according to this view which has also of course set the stage for human control of nature so I mean science has said that the role of humans is to control nature it's to control animals and so then it's left out this whole tradition of seeing the world in a more holistic manner. Um, and of course, it's then very much shaped the way that we do research. And I mean, today, when you look at research um, on the mind, there's very much funding going into neurobiological research. Um, and that, of course, leaves out all these kind of sociological and cultural understandings of the mind. Um, and of course, I mean, in history and philosophy, <coughs> philosophy and cross-cultural research shows that there's been very, you know, um, that various cultures have had very diverse theories about the mind. So within anthropology, I mean, this um, study of the mind has fallen within what's called the anthropology of consciousness. And it's also within this field that this concept of magical consciousness has evolved. And of course, it's, I've been interested in it, as I said, because I've tried to interpret, well, particularly now, one, this one interview that has been so so incredible, <laughs> so difficult to understand, but I mean also in general, because we're trying to develop a concept of the human mind that takes into account this kind of social and cultural um, aspects of it, um, and also the intersubjectivity of the mind. So getting away from this very uh, natural science view of it. Um, so I, well, I'm, I'm thinking that I'll maybe cut out some of the very theoretical part because, I mean, there's, 
theories ex that are related to this, uh, this idea of magical consciousness, um, which I thought I would talk about here in the beginning. But then also I've been reading about um, studies that have been done on contemporary magic, so for example, neo-pagan rituals, and uh, I've be been interested in in finding out what actually happens in this rich in these rituals and how do they describe them. So what are the factors that make people have these kind of changes of consciousness in these ritual contexts? And um, and then in the end, I have this very long, <laughs> long excerpt from this interview with this woman that I call Fina. I think it's interesting to hear how she speaks. And this is only a very small part of the interview, but it's particularly the part where she talks about how she is affected by nature and what she sees as her role as a messenger between worlds and a messenger about what we are doing to nature. So that's how I was thinking of, of proceeding. So basically, this is the intersubjective mind. It's very difficult to have any pictures <laughs> you know, how can you have pictures of even, I mean, when it has to do with these informants, you can only have pictures of the meeting room where, they're, where they meet. And I was saying to someone today, I mean, it's incredible. They have a peer support group, and they sit in an office space with a table and hard chairs like this. And then they're supposed to talk about extremely difficult experiences. So there are experiences of psychosis. There are experiences of being socially abandoned, of... Uh, of being through psychiatric care and feeling that they've been treated very badly. Um, so very difficult experiences, but they're in this environment that is very, very, it's not intimate at all. It's, you know, and then it's very, it's very controlled. There's rules, what they can talk about, what they can't talk about. They all take turns speaking, and it's exactly two hours. So it's, it's a very strange format to actually make people open up and talk about difficult experiences, but that's the way they do it, so. But anyways, um, so this whole issue of magical consciousness also shows that, um, that magic, um, of course, this, this whole thing with nature as a source of inspiration, um, that it's always been there as a source of uh, inspiration, mysticism to humans, so nature has always been very central to us. Uh, and it's been used as a, as a resource due to its diversity and ability to create light, of course, and its perpetuating ability. Um, but then I think also that this whole interest in nature of religions and the creation of new religions like um, contemporary magic has to do with um, the environmental movement uh, and, of, of course, the animal rights movement. So people are kind of turning back to nature as, as a resource, as, as something that they can use uh, to transform themselves individually. So it has a lot to do with personal transformation, which is, of course, uh, a very, very um, strong feature of, of modern society. Um, but also, of course, it's in classical studies of anthropology that we find these references to, to magic, to possession, to uh, trans rituals and these types of things. Uh, but very seldom do these anthropologists actually talk about their own personal experiences uh, of these kinds of things. And then, so that's kind of like, I can describe what other people have experienced, but my own experiences of this, they're, they're, they're not relevant. And so there's this kind of like fear of discussing it on a personal level because you don't know how to explain it, uh, how to give evidence of what actually happened. Um, but what this Susan Greenwood has done, which I think is very good because of the controversy around it, is that she has taken these um, she has taken these theories from classical studies of magic. This is her book, The Nature of Magic. She's written several books. Um, the other book, Magic Witchcraft and the Other World, is not. It's a less academic book actually, because she because as a practitioner, she has written a lot of books about practicing magic, so for the whole sphere of people who are involved in, 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 in contemporary magic. And so she's done this, and she's taken these theories, theories, and, sh theories and shown that um, it's very strong, this field of contemporary magic. So these same theories can be used in a Western context. It's not an issue of those people way over there, somewhere far away, 
countries with strange cultures that are far from us. I mean, they're, they're at a distance from us that they develop these types of ideas, that they have these types of experiences, but we don't. And so she has like reversed this. And of course, we've seen a great um, increase in these kind of esoteric movements in the West. Um, but oftentimes, of course, these, these researchers have interpreted these experiences something that is radically different from us, a radical otherness, instead of taking themselves into the experience, instead of saying that we can all have these kind of transpersonal experiences. It's possible. People train their minds to have these kind of experiences. Um, and one way of doing this is through these rituals that they are involved in. Um, so Greenwood makes this claim um, that um, so the mag that magical thinking in the West is not so different from magical thinking in the rest of the world. And this is really a par paradigmatic shift in thinking. This is really quite radical, what she's saying. And she says that magic is a universal aspect of human consciousness and that it is inherent in the mind. So there's been a lot of, of course, negative associations tied to the use of magic and the tradition <laughs> of magic. Um, so since Christianity developed, of course, it's, uh, and, and has become the dominant religion, a monotheistic view of the world, um, these magical tendencies and groups have become hidden, partially hidden and fragmented. But they've also, um, but they've always been expressed through folk beliefs and mythologies. Um, and of course, I mean, throughout history, you have had very influential um, people, uh, the elite who have used um, the resource of magic, magic. For example, Elizabeth IV relied on a court astrologer, and of course we know the case of Ronald Reagan, and Princess Diana having used astrologers, and, and these are all forms of magic, a magical belief. And of course then we have these, these movements like the Druids. Um, it used to actually be a gentleman society which then turned into this contemporary movement, uh, which has been also present in, in the lower classes, so not, not just in the upper classes. But it has actually, ha it has a long history, and people don't maybe know this, that already in the 1800s they had societies of these druids, and, and um, they were people from the middle classes who, who were part of, of these movements. Um, and of course, I mean, there is this, this revival of these kind of movements, of esoteric movements in the West right now. So I mean, there's loads of different types of groups, neo-pagans and, and um, the use of shamanistic types of ideas. And there's even something called chaos magic, which is a combination of punk rock and, and a magical theory. So I mean, there's, the list is very, very long of these new groups that have developed. But then, so what is this um, concept of magical consciousness? Well, according to Susan Greenwood, it's an expanded aspect of awareness that can, can potentially be experienced by everyone. Uh, it is a, ex expressed in many different situations and contexts, and it, it informs both the shaping of cosmological realities and individual behavior, as well as social structures. This is, of course, a, a very kind of theoretical explanation of it. So she says it's, I mean, it's based on analogical rather than logical thought. So it, it involves the association of ideas, symbols, and meaningful coincidences. So and you could also, I mean, another term that is used for it is altered states of consciousness, shamanic states of consciousness, or experiencing non-ordinary reality. Um, the problem with all these terms is that they are always in opposition to something else. So when you talk about extraordinary, it's always in opposition to ordinary. So it's very difficult to know, to, to use a term that is neutral. So what we have done is that we have started using this concept of humma, hummat kokemukset. So humma means weird, but that's also of course problematic because then we are interpreting what people mean by this concept of humma. But I mean, that's it's a terminological problem as well, because when you use these words, you're already giving value to them. There are experiences that are normal, and there are experiences that are abnormal. And so there's always this kind of like oppositional, dualistic type of thing 
um, behind this, so, so that, that is problematic to us. So she wants to look at, I mean, she's interested in looking at universality and similarity between groups of practitioners rather than looking at the differences between us and them. Um, so, but this is, of course, I mean, it's related to many different types of philosophical ideas. And she has used um, the ideas of a French philosopher called Lucien levy Brew, who had these two ideas, the law of psychic union and the law of participation. So the law of psychic union, union uh, is a fundamental state of mind that included individuals, society, the living as well as the dead. Um, and for him, it's a way of thinking um, that creates relationships between things through unseen forces and influences. Um, and he says that there's two forms of consciousness that exist at the same time, rational, logical, and mystical. In other words, analogical thinking. And this, of course, very much, these ideas very much went against this Enlightenment time thought that the dominant mode of thinking is rationalistic. So he talked of primitive modes of consciousness, the pre-logical alternative modes of thinking formed by collective representations. And these were based on a law of participation. So this was, of course, very controversial and he received a lot of criticism because basically people interpreted that he said that, oh, there's other people uh, in Africa, in Asia, and other parts of the world that they're primitive, um, that they have a primitive way of thinking, but, but they have understood him incorrectly. He just says that there is a, a manner of thinking that is before this kind of logical thinking that was developed, this kind of idea of the, the rational type of thinking. Um, and, um, and this, of course, uh, mystical or analogical thinking is also tied to what uh, psychologist Jung uh, called synchronicity. Uh, so that means the meaning of full coincidence of outer and inner events that are not causally connected. So for example, if uh, I'm thinking of Sue and then suddenly she calls me. So this is like an example of synchronistic thinking. So it's a coincidence. Um, but a meaningful coincidence. And then there's this, uh, he was also mentioned previously by Mariana Gregory Bateson. He has this idea of the ecology of mind, uh, which is also tied to this kind of holistic uh, manner of thinking. Um, so he says that the mind is divided into two ecologies, that of the natural and uh, that of the material and energy exchanges, and the other of an ecology of, de of ideas. Um, and it's this relational view of the mind, which he calls an ecology of mind. Um, so he talks about there being a larger mind, uh, of which the individual mind is only a subsystem. And this is a larger mind that is comparable to what we could call God. And of course, this is all tied to this idea of transpersonality. Um, and so this is, I mean, transpersonal experiences are tied to a state of consciousness associated with personal growth or a process of metamorphosis within us and in our relationship with others, including non-human others. Um, so how do people actually enter into this kind of um, uh, state of magical consciousness? So I mean, there's been, many people have mentioned examples of this already, I mean, today. Dancing, drumming. Drumming is very central to this kind of repetitive sound and quite large, big sound. Because in these rituals, they will use lo lots of people drumming on large drums. And it's very kind of embodied experience because you can feel it in your body when, when, when you're beating these drums. And that people are dancing, um, which either happens um, in a ritual setting or not. Um, usually, some of the rituals that I read about, these neo-pagan rituals, they start early in the evening. People will not eat, and they will continue throughout the night. So basically, you're you know, deprived of energy as well, so you're already in a kind of state of vulnerability uh, physically when, uh, when you start these rituals. Some people talk about light breathing, and so when you breathe like this, so you deprive your brain of oxygen. It also affects what happens uh, in your mind. 
rocking of your body, chanting, so repetitive chanting of the same thing. And this goes on for hours. I mean, you're repeating, repeating. And then, of course, the aesthetics uh, and the effect of the ritual space. So uh, they will usually be some, somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the countryside. I mean, they can also be in an enclosed space inside somewhere in the city. But the rural setting is important because it has to do with people's connection with, with nature and the natural environment. Nighttime, so dark, stars, moon. Uh, people will dress in specific types of costumes. Uh, and the space will usually be very small and enclosed, so there will be people in a small enclosed space, and usually circular movement, so they will move around in a circle. And there will be fires uh, and different types of effects that will put them in this kind of state of mind. So the primary aim of all these, um, these, these techniques that are used is to reach a shift in consciousness to an, an expanded awareness, which may involve the invocation of spirits. And these are spirits of animals, stones, trees, natural elements. Um, so among the people that, that Susan Greenwood interviewed um, were persons who through trans dance became connected with spirits and that the, the, when people were dancing they would hand over their bodies to the spirits so the, bodies, so the body becomes a vehicle for the spirit. Um, so in these descriptions of, of these transformative experiences, these persons are no longer human during the trance. They become animals. They become distant from themselves. And they are very much aware of their existing two levels, simultaneous, simultaneous levels of consciousness. Um, so it's basically you're be between the level of being conscious and non-conscious. Um, so primarily it works through an inner imaginative transformative process. So they use association, seeming coincidence, uh, and through the experience of many different levels of awareness which are interpreted through symbols. So she talked about her inner journey where she became a bird. Um, and um, so the first journey that she had was the most impressive to her and she became a white owl. A white owl came to her, and it had emerged from a black crow. And this whiteness symbolized light in darkness, and, her, and the flight of flying like a bird symbolized to her moving between worlds and seeking information about these other worlds. And so it's a, it was a power, now it's a power link between her, this level of reality, and the other world. So basically, whenever she sees a white owl, it reminds her of this connection that she has to these other worlds. And to her, it of course also indicates, and to most people who have these kind of transformative experiences, it indicates that nothing is fixed or static when you have a holistic perspective on the world. Um, and then th there are certain transformational aspects that are present when uh, practitioners enter, um, experience magical consciousness. They may feel unconditional love and compassion with the universe. Um, they feel as if they are enchanted. Um, oneness with and love for nature, so they will go out and hug trees or touch plants. They want to have a connection to nature, so connecting to nature in a very tactile sense. And there will be this shift in consciousness. And usually it's very multisensory, so it has to do with vision, smell, hearing, touch, and allowing you to see a bigger picture of the world. And of course, it very much involves in this kind of metamorphosis from human into animal shape. Um, and I mean, we have lots of references to this. I mean, in, in popular literature and folk tales, this is from a book called The Frog Princess by a, a, a Russian author, Viktor Vasnetsov. Um, but I mean, we have lots of examples of this also in popular culture. And, um, and as we heard today also, that it's, it's common that people have these ideas that, that we can shift into animals and back. Um, uh, but what matters in these magical rituals, as with most religious rituals, is a suspension of disbelief and being prepared to accept the ritual on its own terms. And so there's this very, there's this, this um, 
American anthropologist who has studied people's experiences of hearing the voice of God. But before that research, she was doing research on, on spiritualist and modern day witchcraft in the UK. In that research, she said that um, to people who engage in these rituals, the ideas of magical practice make progressively more sense and seem progressively more natural. The magician becomes more likely to believe in their truth by acting as if they were true <coughs> and defending them in conversation. Um, so contradiction, tension, uh, performance, and half-conscious understandings play a very simple role in rituals. But it also has very much to do with which is related to this tarantella experience also, is being able to relinquish control. So you have to let go of control. So in a ritual context, that is your license to lose control. And that they believe that it's very necessary that people have these spaces where they can lose control. Um, and it allows them to discover something that changes their lives. And this cannot usually be expressed verbally. For many people, they don't remember parts of these experiences in ritual when they're in trance. It's just wiped out of their mind. They can remember parts of it. So it's kind of like being in psychosis. Also people who experience psychosis, they forget details of what happened during the psychosis. So it's a mechanism also in your brain that kind of like frees your brain space. Um, um, so they move out of the everyday world where meaning and order are central through a liminal space of trance and inversion and then are safely returned to the mundane world. Um, so the, this, this kind of engagement in magic is either I mean, through reading and solitary practice, but very much is through this kind of shared communal involvement. So they are with other people in these rituals and they create these meanings and symbols together. Um, so when they participate, they participate in a way that accepts the ritual because it is a public act visible both the witnesses and performers of the ritual themselves. Um, and their sense and understanding of self and morality of relational etiquette changes as a result of the ritual process. So this is a, a very central thing in this. I think that it's both kind of like a collective experience and an individual experience, but it's, it's about um, a change, a transpersonal change for them individually. So it tells them something about themselves, but at the same time, they change the way that they view the world after they have been in these rituals. Um, it changes the way that they act also in the normal, mundane world. And often, I mean, they say also with people who become healers or who have these like experiences of enlightenment, um, that they usually, uh, before that, they've had some kind of experience, some kind of personal crisis. So a divorce, a serious illness, a struggle in everyday life. Um, and this is often what then makes them become mediums or makes them become spiritual healers. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a common thing. So it's preceded by this very, this moment of chaos and a moment of co completely losing control. And then they, they reach this level of enlightenment. But then um, I thought it would actually end with these excerpts from this interview and I call this woman Tina. Uh, she was a 26-year-old woman, extremely intense in her personality and very, very sharp. She, was, she had such a sharp mind. I mean, it was so engaging to sit and listen to her. And then when you hear someone talk about these kind of extreme experiences, you have to, of course, I mean, the, the first premise is you believe the person, of course. You never start with the judgment that she's crazy. You know, they sound absolutely crazy. It was just, I mean, it's just so fascinating, the, the world that she describes. So she started having these experiences already at a very young age as a child. Um, and she says she was um, a very spiritual, she was very spir spiritually open as a child, so she started having these experiences from the age of zero to three, and she was a very open and positive child. And she says that she remembers having the cessation of having an extra pair of ears, which she calls sensory antlers, ice net. Then later she uses the term uh, fine-tuned ear, ears, 
Mm. So she made a difference between having physical ears and having these sensory ears. Um, and she used to see small forest trolls as a child, and she could hear them ring the flowers in the forest, but then they, grew, then they disappeared as they grew older. And it is actually common that a lot of children have imaginary friends. And they're actually, I mean, they actually see these imaginary friends. This is not an uncommon type of experience. And she makes a very clear distinction between her physical and spiritual self and body. She experiences very vastly different levels of reality. Levels of reality that are a long distance from this earth, where she communicates with celestial beings. And then she also often feels that she's with a very thin line attached to this physical reality. And it requires really a lot of work and energy for her to stay grounded in this world. So she has periods of being completely mentally and even physically exhausted. And she had actually um, been taking uh, psychiatric medication for a while, but she stopped because she said it just completely numbed all her senses. And she said she, it's like being, for her, it was like being dead. So she said she would rather than live with the experiences that she, that, that she has than take this medication. So this is now a quote from the, from the interview. Um, and she says this. Lately, I've been having some experience, experiences that have been really nasty and I felt very strongly in my whole body. I'm not able to do anything else than lie shaking on the floor and gasping for breath. And babbling something incomprehensible. Early Simlan, Kasitta It has somehow been linked to the forest nature nature consciousness in a strong way. It does, it does not have to do with my free will or the will of my physical self. My spiritual self has most prob probably been voluntarily involved. I have experiences of nature liter literally coming into me. And then forest is growing from my back. Last winter I often had the feeling that from the back of my neck and ears and up on my head, I had these huge antlers, growing, really large antlers. I had to constantly walk in such a way that I kept my balance, and they, the antlers, pulled my neck upwards. At times it was, really, it was a really strong feeling. The antlers made concrete my connection to these other levels of consciousness. The antlers were very horn-like and very animate and quite heavy. When they grew, it affected my physical body very much, and somehow my personality was lost. I had to dance all these crazy wild dances to release it physically from myself. It was growing and growing, and it felt this small body was not sufficient to bear it. Okay, that was the antlers. Now, lately, forest has been growing from my back. Um, and from my chest, and it grows with enormous pressure like it was gushing forth. My body starts shaking and vibrating, and luckily I'm usually alone when this happens because I cannot at all control what happens. I sense a sound aspect very strongly. I hear this speech that I cannot understand at all. It's not Finnish language. It's not a language of this earth. There is this ancient aspect to it, and it seems to be familiar to me. I can manage to get a comprehensible translation. What this voice speaks is so sad and horrible that I almost burst of sorrow. I have not been able to do much this often because I've had to deal with these issues, with how a goddess cries, how she's pressed down and raped, and she is given infertile seed. For example, Monsanto and this is a multinational seed company. Um, it, Monsanto, is a demonic force affecting the spiritual. There is some kind of incredible evil behind it and how we, in a very disrespectful and tactless manner, take from the earth what we want in order to make consumer goods. We mine the earth so we can produce industrial chemicals to the arms industry and the pharmaceutical industry. We shatter the earth so that we can destroy it. The manner in which minerals affect the entirety of the earth has an enormous effect on the earth. It is sad that we do foolish things. I have been connected to these issues and it's an experience that is quite heavy for one person to carry. I have not found any channel through which to discuss these issues because they are so strange. And she's really very lonely because she can't discuss this with anyone. Um, so then I ask her, what does nature mean to you? 
Nature is the most alive layer of the earth. It is where the physical and spiritual meet in the most profound manner. It is a point of convergence, a very important point of convergence. Nature is full of this kind of accepting love and self-perpetuating harmony. It organizes itself according to the patterns of eternity. The way I view trees, trees are very dear to me. I encounter the tree's spirit. I meet the tree's collective soul. What trees show us on a physical level is a very small part of what a tree really is. They are enormous entities. The physicality of the tree is just a shell. All of which it is made up of is what we sense through our humanity because we humans are very much like trees. We are very much like trees and that is why we see them so clearly as entities with a trunk, branches, a crown, leaves. Our spiritual side is very reminiscent of the structure of a tree. Also, we have branches, a crown and roots into the ground. People are very much connected to forests. Earlier, we have respected the forest very much, and we have memorialized it. The foolish Finn does not realize that by growing cultivated forests, he captivates his own soul. The soul remains there as a prisoner. Another thing is that the trees are sad and confused, wondering what this is. It's really horrible that because we humans have forgotten trees, they have started to feel sorrow, which they have not felt before. This has not been there in the sphere of nature before. They have now been burdened with very different emotions. The Christian church has been a central agent in all of this because in the 1500s, when they, the converges, started invading Finland, the most important thing was for them was to cut down all the holy groves. People were given an impression that if you respect the forest, you will die. This is very strong in us Finns, and this is the reason why we so carelessly give in to having our trees being taken because we are afraid of being punished, although in our depths there is a suspect of force. It would not surprise me if all these depressions and ailments that we Finns suffer from are caused by us mistreating nature. We feel guilt, and depression grows from this guilt, that one has treated oneself or someone else badly. The way we treat nature is very much about how we treat ourselves. Um, so then, um, then I also ask her, then uh, later on I ask her, she talks about the expansion of her mind, um, and, about, and I asked her, that, does this ability grow with age? So do you grow into this, this ability to receive these different types of ri realities? Um, and that, that will you reach a limit at some stage of your, your ability to receive these things? And she says that my experience is that it is limit, limitless, but I have a free will and I can decide how fast these things evolve. Of course, there is also the option to just withdraw from everything, but I have seen it as an option and decided that if I would do that, I would become disabled because then I would no longer fulfill my task. So then I ask her, what do you think is your task? I have never said this out loud before to anyone. So I say, you don't need to do it if you don't want to. She says, yes, I do want to. I want to do it to remind us to open up the world so that certain things can flow again, some kind of messenger. So I ask, for example, about what we're doing to nature, for example, that, and about our eternal soul, and about the broadness of our being. I'm still not very clear about all of this, so I can't start trumpeting about it, although I've done this all my life. Um, and so she said that she's been through this growth process, and that she has to trust herself. She knows that she's given only the amount of spiritual work, work that she's capable of handling. She says that the messages that come to her come through a chain of cooperation of tubes going through her through which energy flows and she keep, needs to keep this channel open so that the energy can flow. Uh, this is more to do with all of us than just her personally. It has to do with the balance in the world. She's an instrument of this energy that flows through different levels of reality, like a pillar or antenna that connects the earth and the heavens. So. And this was, of course, only a very small part of the story. I mean, this was like one and a half hours of her talking about these experiences and the meetings. So how, 
are you going to interpret this? I mean, it's obvious that she has taken influences from many different types of, of, of traditions, like theosophical traditions and spiritual traditions. And you, can, you can see the elements of that in there. Um, but it's really very profound what she says, because it's a very, very strong criticism of what we're doing to nature. And so, of course, we'd say, she's crazy. I mean, you know, what is she talking? But I mean, I think she has a very important message. And um, it's impossible to say, I mean, what is this? What is this experience? What is it that she has experienced? And that she can't actually, it's very difficult for her to be publicly active. As I said, you know, she says that she has all these other visions of things that could be developed, but that she has no ambition because she's so burdened um, by this experience that um, constantly happens to her. I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't ask for these experiences. They just come on to her. Um, so one last thing that Greenwood has said is that she finds that we need to move away from the idea of an object self, the rational ego as a permanent state and instead open up the possibility of an observing self. Because this would allow the mind to connect with matter and nature as a living organism and help us overcome our anthropocentric projection, projections into the natural world. And she says, she suggests that we achieve this by developing a shamanic way of knowing. And perhaps this is precisely what Tina is doing, but she doesn't use these pre precise terms for what she's experiencing daily. Yeah. How many of people here think they have had some kumma extraordinary experiences? 